Sports Studies Unit annual seminar series, and it's our pressure, uh, pleasure to welcome all of you to this space and to welcome Professor Amy Lubatel, um, all the way from the west coast of the United States in Portland. Welcome, Amy, and welcome everybody. So first, I'm going to introduce Professor Lubatel. Then I will pass the floor on to our guest speaker, who is going to give a 30-minute presentation, and then uh, we'll give the way to the Q&A. If anybody has any comments or questions, there's a chat box and you can just write them in there and I will be collecting them for the discussion after the presentation. Um, so Professor Amy Lubita is Associate Professor of Sociology at the Portland State University, where she is part of the Transportation Research and Education Center. Uh, she has an extensive publication record on the topics of mobility, gender, sexuality, race and class with a focus on equity and justice. And she is one of few researchers who are empirically addressing this, this link that has long been suspect between cycling and gentrification, which I find really interesting. And she's also been doing some really important and innovative work researching transgender and gender non-conforming people's mobilities and immobilities, which is obviously very welcome work. Uh, her most recent papers include a study on collective trauma in queer communities in Portland, published in Sexuality and Culture, a paper on sustainability, equity, and mobility, published in Urban Geography, and a paper in the journal Transport Geography titled Transforming Mobility Justice, Gender Harassment, and Violence on Transit. Amy's talk today is entitled Transportation and Mobility Justice, Race, Class, and Gender Intersections in the United States. Uh, before giving the floor to Amy, I'm going to have to ask everybody to turn off your microphones if you haven't done so already, uh, so that we can have the best audio possible. And I'm going to share Amy's slides now. Uh, hopefully this will work and we'll have no more complications. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, do you see the slides? You got it. There we go. Um, how do I enter full screen? Just down at the bottom, there's a, yep, by the four squares over on the left side. Yep. Is that all right, Amy? Perfect, thank you. Okay. Let me know when I'll pass the slides. Okay, perfect. Um, so yes, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Paola, and uh, thanks to Kirsty and to everyone for hosting me. I'm, I'm really, really excited to be here. I, uh, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I haven't been part of the um, previous, uh, you know, conversations you've been having in the seminar series, but I'm really excited to get some maybe feedback and some insights. I'm, uh, I've got a new paper that I'm working on. You're also kind of guinea pigs right now because normally when I do some presentations, I'll focus um, really narrowly on one qualitative interview or focus group study. But what I decided to do for today was bring together three different projects I've been working on and try and show you some of the common threads that are coming up for people who are part of kind of marginalized groups. Um, so my goal today is really to just highlight a couple of different research studies and then kind of think about theorizing around mobil mobility justice uh, in relationship to the, the project I'm working on right now, which is about uh, BIPOC or Black Indigenous people of color um, who ride bicycles. So so I'm hoping to get some feedback and I'd love to have a great conversation at the end here. So um, Paula, let's do it. Next slide. So my broader research aims as a sociologist and as a transportation scholar are, are really to understand the context in which women, gender minorities, um, and, and I consider gender minorities to be folks who are trans, who are gender non-conforming, um, and then BIPOC uh, populations and how they experience active transportation. So a lot of my research in the past has looked at walking, um, you know, how do people get around in, in the city of Portland? Um, how do transportation, uh, how do transportation systems, our buses, our trains, it not necessarily center the experiences of these marginalized populations? And then I have a lot of research on bicycling. I'm, I'm really excited about biking and, and I want lots of people to bike. And so I have all of these questions about um, bicycling. So I'm going to, again, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the theories I'm most excited about right now, uh, what the context here in Portland looks like. Uh, I'll highlight some of these interview studies that I've uh, worked on or am working on right now. We'll talk about some barriers to active transportation that are consistent across all of those different projects. And then I want to kind of close out by thinking about how do we push this envelope um, when it comes to talking about mobility justice um, even further. All right, next slide. So um, one of the things I think is most interesting, and I really love the paper um, that uh, Ursilia and Tim uh, wrote, that is 
the introduction to a series on mobility justice in the Journal of Transport Geography. And I, I'm really trying to center myself in this discourse around mobility justice. And I think their paper was really helpful in kind of laying out the fact that there are, you know, there's a whole bunch of literature on transport equity. There's a whole bunch of literature on transport justice. And then there's this, you know, realm of mobility justice. So how do we kind of think about all of these things in a, in a larger context? And so I'm really interested in the ways in which, you know, what are the capacities people have to move through different spaces? Um, how do we think about larger systems of oppression, larger dynamics around ableism, about white supremacy, right? How do all of those things impact mobility across different disadvantaged groups? And then I'm always keeping an eye on things like violence, harassment, exclusion. So so what do those experiences look like for people um, as they're going about using public transport or, or riding bicycles? Next slide. So again, drawing on this um, 2020 paper, um, I, I really love the way in which um, you can come together and think about the fact that mobility justice um, is not just a state of affairs, but is an ongoing process of power relations and struggles over praxis, meaning and values that are actively shaped by the places and spatial configurations as part of which they unfold. I think that this to me is a really significant um, component here that we need to think about the spatiality. So how do people move through specific parts of the city? Uh, and, and of course, I'm coming to you from, from the west coast of the United States, which, which has a very different um, historical and geographic context than other cities or than other countries. And so, um, you know, anything that I'm talking about today, I recognize is, you know, is is situated in that specific context. But I think that there are similarities or different parts of theorizing we can kind of move to and apply in different settings. Uh, and and again, I think that the the value of thinking about this in terms of mobility justice is about the kind of um, Again, the second quote here, the emergent and place specific ways of living um, that are really significant. OK, next slide. So yeah, I put a little heart over there. That's me way over there in Portland. It is gloomy. It is rainy. Um, it is close to spring here, but not quite yet. Um, we're a relatively small ish city uh, as compared to some of the other big cities in the US, um, about 640,000 people um, in the city of Portland. But um, if you count all of our suburbs, it's about 3 million people. Um, it's a rapidly urbanizing place and we have lots and lots of people moving from, I would call them probably climate refugees moving from California because we have um, a kind of a very extreme fire seasons now on the West Coast. And so a lot of people are relocating to further north. Um, so interesting kind of changes happening here in Portland. Uh, so there's rapid development and gentrification happening um, throughout the city. Uh, and I would say we have historically had a reputation in the United States as being a bike friendly city. So we have a, a significant bike infrastructure as compared to a lot of other uh, US cities. Um, but we also have a lot of um, intense social inequality. Um, there's a really significant a large homeless population here um, that's only growing uh, as a result of the pandemic and the kind of economic changes that are occurring. So we're we're definitely a city in flux, a city that is going through a lot of different kinds of changes. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little context about what's what's happening here. Um, next slide. Uh, maybe this picture is not going to work, but uh, if it oh there it is. So this is um, one of our forms of transportation. We do have a um, bus system. This is a streetcar. So we've got a connected um, streetcar system through the uh, downtown parts of Portland. And then we do have a light rail system. Um, none of them are necessarily, um, so, so Portland I would say has less frequent service on all of these uh, kinds of transportation as compared to a city like Chicago or New York. But we do have these kind of um, different kinds of transportation options for folks. So there it is. It's beautiful. It's not that sunny today, though. All right. <laughs> Next slide. So I'm going to be focusing on three different studies I've uh, done in the past. Um, I have published papers um, on the uh, first two. So the first um, study I'll be talking to you about is transgender and gender nonconforming transit users. Uh, I'll then be talking about uh, a study that was do doing interviews with women and black indigenous people of color bicyclists. And then my most recent project that I'm hoping to maybe get some great feedback from you all on is on uh, just black indigenous people of color um, who identify as men uh, and their experiences biking here in Portland. All right, next slide. So in all of the interview projects that I have done, I kind of use the same approach. Um, I do semi-structured interviews with bicyclists and transit users. These have been in phone or in person over the phone. And then because of the pandemic, we switched to a number of um, Zoom interviews. 
if you have questions about the differences <coughs> to talk about research methods. Um, I typically ask questions of people. Um, I like to ask open ended questions like tell me about a positive or a negative experience you had on the bus or the train or riding your bike. I'll ask people about barriers to active transportation um, and suggestions that they might have for the city of Portland. I'm typically recruiting pe people by putting up actual paper flyers in places like uh, libraries or grocery stores. I use social media pr pretty extensively to recruit people. Um, I'll use snowball sampling and then I do a lot of outreach in um, community centers or working with community based organizations in order to make sure we've got um, some good representation of different groups of people. Uh, I typically like to work in a research team. I love to work with graduate students, and so we'll often work as a team using qualitative data analysis software. Um, and I, I always refer to this as an inductive approach. We're kind of looking to see what's out there, um, not, not necessarily trying to prove a particular theory. All right, next slide. All right, so this first study, I'll just give you a quick overview who was part of this study. Um, we did the study, so I had some great research assistance in 2015 and 2016. Um, we had a number of different kind of um, voices represented in the trans and gender nonconforming transit users study. Um, these are the pronouns that people used, so a, a pretty kind of wide range of people identifying either as male, um, he, him, she, her, or they, them. Um, we had some um, kind of overrepresentation of people who are white, um, which is really what led to um, me doing some additional research um, kind of afterward. I'm not going to talk about that today, but um, historically in Portland, we have we are a very white city, um, so it is um, oftentimes we have an overrepresentation of people who identify as white. Um, age range of 18 to 59, um, and then we 19 of these folks were transit dependent, so we really were trying to get to folks who who did not have access to a car um, and who were mostly relying on the bus or the train to get around. All right, next slide. Uh, the second study I'll be talking about uh, comes uh, from 2016 and 2017, where we were talking to women and BIPOC cyclists. In this study, we had a pretty good um, representation of different um, racial and ethnic backgrounds of the women participants, but we had a hard time recruiting men of color, which is why we uh, I'm working on the study I am now, where we really just wanted to go out and talk to men of color specifically about their experiences riding bikes. OK, next slide. And then yes, this is the study I'm really excited about and working on right now. Um, I'll be giving you some kind of like hot off the presses. We're just looking at the data that we've collected, but um, we've got some great representation of different perspectives of men of color here in Portland. And we, uh, yeah, um, give you a little taste of some of those findings. So next slide. OK, so what I'm hoping to do here is to show you some of the consistent themes across these three studies that are linked to barriers to active transportation. Um, I, I have different. Um, out, there's like a pseudonym for the person who I'm referring to. Um, I, I'm really just hoping for you to get the sense of like th these are widespread issues for people in Portland who are from marginalized backgrounds. I, none of the kind of claims I'm about to make are true of all of the studies or all of the groups, but I think they're things that I've consistently seen rise to the top in, in all of these different projects um, and in kind of my years of experience here in Portland. So let's let's see if this works. Let's see if I can um, kind of bring all these things together for you. OK, next slide. Thanks. So I think that this is likely to be true of, of women in particular um, and not necessarily um, all of the men that we have interviewed for some of our other studies, but I think it's important and significant to always keep at the kind of center of our minds as we're thinking about barriers to active transportation, just the the demands that women uniquely experience um, in terms of reproductive or household labor. Uh, so I think that in some of our projects, we've seen a lot of women talking about the fact that it is hard to access public transportation during the time of day that you might need to get a kid to school or go to the grocery store or to take care of a loved one. And I think in terms of the bicycling research we've done, um, it's really difficult for moms to do what this lovely mom is doing, um, which is to <laughs> take your kids to school, get to the grocery store, do all the things you need to do. Um, so, I, so I always want us to keep in the, you know, um, this discussion of mobility justice, the ways in which um, there's, uh, you know, the, the realities of gender division of, of labor have an impact on people's mobility, have an impact on how people use or access um, different forms of transportation. So uh, here Evelyn says, uh, this is, I think, a feminist issue and why women don't ride bikes as much because we're very often the ones who are responsible for childcare and child pickup and grocery shopping, which is more difficult to do for a family on a bike. 
uh, when you start to have those family responsibilities, you don't have as many choices about transportation when you're a privileged person such as myself. So here Evelyn is even saying, you know, I do have access to a car. I do have all the privilege in the world and I still can't figure out how to ride the bike to the grocery store with my kids. So I think that there's a, again, she's pointing out the ways in which there are different levels of privilege that are going to be factoring into this. OK, next slide. Uh, so one of the consistent things that has come up in many of our studies where we're talking to trans and gender nonconforming folks, when we're talking to cisgender women, uh, is just that there is a lot of gender based harassment that is happening anytime people are leaving their homes. Uh, so in some of these instances um, here, I think I have two different quotes from biking studies, but I think that uh, I chose these quotes because I think they're more. Um, maybe more common experiences, but what I found to be so interesting about many of the projects that I've done is that this harassment happens um, in all kinds of places. It's not just if you're on a bike. It is not just if you are um, waiting for the train. It's kind of a consistent sort of um, low level noise that many women experience when they're, they're just um, going to and from home or work. Um, so here um, Katie says, um, you know, she's had a lot of experience, not just like cat calling or yelling out the window, but you know, there's a lot of that, uh, but I'm constantly told on my ass looks and people slowing down, trying to have a conversation, getting cut off the road because someone thinks it's fun to make fun to make me feel more anxious. And then in the second quote there, you can see that um, in, in that particular instance, someone's talking about um, actually feeling like they're going to be run off the road. Um, so again, this gendered harassment is not specific just to bicycles, um, is happening in many of these different public spaces. All right, next slide. Uh, in, in extending this a little bit longer, um, one of the th um, things we have written about in the past um, is, is some of the ways that harassment and fears of violence can actually restrict or restrain people's mobility. Uh, and I love this quote um, from Nancy where she actually talks about the fact that you have a different map in, in your head. Um, she called it a ladies map of the city, like you shouldn't go there at night. Um, and so I love this quote because it really gets to the fact that there's that kind of double consciousness um, to, to steal a little bit from Du Bois, um, my one of my sociology heroes. Um, there are these different ways in which we're we're viewing the, the world in different ways. Um, so so women are saying this part of the city is off limits. I can't go there at this time of day. Uh, and so it is a different way of thinking about mobility. Um, additionally, um, you know, I, I think that Fears of violence will, will constrain people's uh, movement and mobility, but there are also different kinds of um, verbal harassment that people experience um, when using public transit, when waiting for trains. Um, I included the, the quote there from Piper under verbal harassment uh, because I think that this is a pretty typical finding from our um, work with transgender and gender nonconforming folks that there is kind of constant um, questioning of people's gender, questioning of people's um, kind of right to access public transportation. Um, and so this is um, one example of that. Uh, it, along with that, um, misrecognition may not necessarily be an overt form of harassment, but what tends to happen for folks who are trans and gender nonconforming is that the daily practice of kind of getting on and off a bus and having uh, having to engage with a bus driver um, often meant that there were kind of daily moments where bus drivers either intentionally or unintentionally misgendered them. So by saying hello sir or hello ma'am, uh, potentially sometimes doing it in a way that's contentious um, was just a daily challenge. It was kind of this um, uh, a moment where people were like, do I really want to get on the bus and do this today? Um, and, and so I think that uh, that's something that's more subtle, but I think um, very, very meaningful in terms of, um, of, of people's capacity to be mobile. OK, next slide. Um, here again, I am trying to extend the these discussions to think about gender discrimination and violence. So so harassment, I think, is one thing where you may experience some harmful things that occur that make you not want to get on a train, not want to get on a bus, not want to ride your bike. But in fact, what what I think has been most interesting is to look at some of the places in which there's actual um, actually different treatment and discrimination that occurs because of people's gender and their gender presentation. Um, so here Christine says the, the bus stopped, the door opened. I started to put my foot on the platform and the bus driver looked at me and said, uh, uh not on my bus, buddy. Closed the door and drove off. So in Christine's example, Christine is a, a trans woman um, and the driver recognized her as being a transgender woman and wouldn't allow her to get onto the bus. Um, and so in that context, um, it's, it's not just that there may be that daily misrecognition, but really there may be actually kind of limited mobility um, and discrimination that occurs. Uh, along with this, um, a quarter of the participants in the trans and gender nonconforming study reported experience of physical assault, assault that they believe to be motivated by 
uh, people being transphobic. Uh, these occurred either on train platforms, at bus stops, um, and in and around the kind of public spaces that people are using for public transportation. Uh, so, so I do think that there's a really significant finding that we we need to continue to pay attention, sort of that interstitial, I don't know if that's the right word I want to use, but that space that's not just, it's not just the bus, it's not just the train, it's kind of all of those public spaces that make up our transportation system. Those are equally as um, risky um, and potentially more so without the the sort of additional more official, you know, driver or other passengers being around. OK, next slide. OK, um, as we start to as I want to kind of move into thinking a little bit more about race, um, there's this um, intense um, racial profiling that is happening, I think, here in the United States um, and, and lots of other locations as well. Um, but here, Cleo uh, and Shannon are talking about the fact that that people will other passengers, other people who are waiting for the train or the bus will oftentimes respond to them in a negative manner. And they can't necessarily tell if the person is being racist or if they're being um, transphobic. And so they have these kind of moments where they're not exactly sure why they're getting negative attention or why people are responding in harmful ways. Um, but it has to do with a kind of combination, the intersections of gender and race. Next slide. Um, so this is from the um, most recent. So I want to transition into um, thinking about a couple of the race related dynamics that we have observed. Um, one thing that consistently happened in many of the interviews that we've done with um, men of color who bike uh, is again verbal harassment that occurs. And many times I think the verbal harassment that, that we've seen men experiencing is much more intense. It's much more extreme. Um, that's a lot of use of really problematic and harmful uh, language. So here you can see um, the the way in which Liam is encountering this as he's riding his bike and being made to feel unsafe because someone is using this terminology. Um, we had a number of men who, black men, who talked about being called the N-word while they were riding their bikes. So again, we've got this, um, th that public space being this really contentious moment as people are being recognized as gender nonconforming or they're being recognized as a person of color. All right, next slide. Uh, so here, this is from the first, this interview excerpt is from the first project we were doing with women and BIPOC riders. Uh, there's some great work that's coming out right now on Biking While Black. Um, one of um, our a colleague at um, California is doing some work on, on what are the, you know, what are some of the disproportionate statistics when you think about traffic citations that are given to people of color when they're riding their bikes as opposed to white folks. Um, but here I think that policing is a really significant, um, it's omnipresent here in the United States, uh, the, the kind of fears that people and people of color in particular have when it comes to feeling like the police are going to stop you. Um, so here um, Janae is saying she doesn't ride at night because the police officers and possibly getting stopped. Um, she actually, you know, she's concerned about getting shot and she never feels safe while cycling. Uh, so, so there are these very different ways in which um, it's it's an you know objectively different risk to take as a person of color to to be on a bicycle, to be visible, um, to be moving through public spaces in the U.S. All right, next slide. The other thing that has come up in many of our most recent interviews is the larger political and social context here in not just the United States, but here specifically in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so on the left, you see that this is um, this is from a Proud Boys protest in 2019 in Portland. The Proud Boys, for those of you who don't know, are the often armed uh, white nationalist. Um, some people will call them neo-Nazi group in Portland and Oregon, um, Washington as well. They have a very active presence. Um, they will show up in large, large groups like this. Um, the police tend to be somewhat, um, I don't want I don't know if supportive is the right word, but the, they tend to be not um, restrained by the police in the same way that some other protests might be. Um, so these folks have a pretty active presence and did um, all throughout uh, the summer of 2019 and 2020. Um, that has had a significant impact on people who are men of color in particular who are riding around on their bikes. Um, a lot of the Proud Boys um, will put really like I can't explain how big, um, very, very large Trump flags on their trucks and they drive through the streets very menacingly when they come to these protests. So there are really specific ways in which um, people of color and men of color are worried about being able to be out on the street, being able to to ride their bikes. Um, 
during these moments of time or if they come into contact or see one of these trucks um, if they're just out on a regular bike ride. Um, on the right, I also put a picture of, oops, sorry. Um, sorry. There's another story to tell you. Um, the, the, the other story that came up during our interviews um, was about this black, black Liberation Ride that happened in June 2020 in Portland. Um, this is a ride organized by and for people of color to celebrate. It actually happens on Juneteenth, which is a really important uh, marker of the end of slavery. Uh, so it's a really, it's supposed to be a celebratory day. Um, they organized a huge bicycle kind of collective bike ride to go through the city of Portland. And they were actually, um, as people were crossing through an intersection, a car decided to drive through the bike ride. Um, so nobody was um, very, horribly injured, but it was this visible moment, um, this kind of marker of the tensions here, I think, in terms of people wanting to assert space as people of color, as black riders, uh, and that being met with resistance and violence. Okay, next slide. Uh, so I only had half an hour today. I could go on about this stuff forever. Um, things that came up in so many of the different projects I've done are that intersectionality matters, that, that nobody is just a person of color or just a woman, um, that people have um, very significant economic and class differences. Um, we, we heard from a lot of people about the importance of body size. Um, you know, how you look matters to how you are responded to in public. Uh, your age, the language you speak, your immigration status, uh, whether or not you have a disability. All of these identities, I think, are part of this process of understanding how mobility matters, how mobility is realized. Uh, I don't have time to go into every single one of these today, but I, I want to be sure to, to reiterate that these things are all kind of happening together for so many people. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm really interested in, and I'm starting to wrap this up, I promise. Um, I'm really interested in some of the ways in which, like the Black Liberation Ride for me, represents this moment where people of color are trying to reclaim some of that public space and trying to say this is, we have a right to use this space, we have a right to be here in public, um, and and then are met with this, this very violent pushback. Uh, and so I'm really interested in how are people reasserting the right to that public space? What does it look like? Um, I, I included this um, picture here. We actually used to be the bicycle capital and we are not, so we had to paint over that sign. So I think it's like this this, um, this great like depiction of the fact that even if you think you're the bicycle capital, you haven't figured it all out if this is, you know, if we have these kinds of mobility challenges for people. Um, but here, I think I've got two quotes that are just showing some of the things that um, people, women and people of color are, are wanting, and it's sort of safe spaces to practice bicycling that, you know, the way that they want to ride and the, and the you know, not feeling the pressures that I think a lot of people feel to, to be a certain kind of biker, a, you know, a person who bikes really, really fast or who has a fancy bike. Uh, so I think that that right to public space means, you know, being okay with people riding their bikes more slowly. Um, it means that we might have to think of infrastructures that are more, uh, open and um, that are more accessible to, to families, that are accessible to people with disabilities. All right, next slide. This is one of my favorite quotes uh, from the um, men biking study. Um, Alan says, um, I feel like being out on the road is kind of an act of defiance. Uh, I know I'm still putting a target on my back, which is why I go out and try to ride so intentionally and take it so seriously. But I think that in general, there's so much more well, there is more so than just the politics, the structure of Oregon, from what from what it seems in the structure of Portland, is more in line with latent white supremacy than just neo-Nazism. So here, Alan is saying that, sure, those Proud Boys come. Yes, they are neo-Nazis. Yes, those are clearly racist people who do not want me to be on my bike. But he's actually saying what's more significant here is the day-to-day -day stuff that he experiences, the um, routine interactions with uh, white bicyclists that may be tension-filled, um, negative interactions with, with um, cars. Um, so he's really talking about the fact that it's it's the low level everyday kind of white supremacy that is more problematic for him. Um, so I think that that's really telling about the the importance of this you know context, the history, um, and sort of thinking about how these race relations play out um, in the particular context of of Portland and I think the United States. All right, next slide. So if I were to sum up kind of what I think are some of the consistencies across these interviews. Um, we know that there are physical barriers to active transportation for women, gender minorities, um, and BIPOC individuals. Um, there are certain ways in which those um, infrastructures are just not designed for them. 
they're not necessarily feeling like it's something that they can regularly do or regularly access. And then we have complex social barriers linked to fears or experiences of harassment and discrimination, racial profiling, the gender division of labor, and just an overall lack of community support for um, diverse um, and robust mobility choices. All right, next slide. The impacts of this, um, to me, I think that Lachelle, this quote points out the fact um, that when people of color are able to access this freedom of mobility, um, it doesn't always feel as free as it does, or you know, they're presuming it doesn't feel as free as it would if they were the, the person who the system was designed for. She says she can't really enjoy her experience as a typical person because of all the oppression that comes with riding a bike as an African American. So to me, a lot of what I'm hoping to, to theorize and continue to write about when it comes to mobility justice is just thinking about these intersecting systems of oppression um, and the, the ways that that freedom of movement, the, the freedom to access all the different things we want people to have access to, um, is routinely curtailed, restrained, and reshaped by these larger um, social forces. Okay, I'm almost done. I think, yeah, there we go. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, speak a little louder. So we have just a few minutes left, so we can go on to questions. Okay, yep, I'll wrap it up with this one. Great. So yes, so if we're theorizing mobility justice, I, I have written some work in the past about the sort of, you know, who is a transit system designed for, who is cycling infrastructure designed for. Um, we tend to find that it's designed for the sort of ideal transit user who's a cisgender able-bodied commuters. Um, the, the work that I've been doing on race in the United States is really suggesting that these public spaces are very highly racialized as white spaces. And so even when people try and take up space on public transport or in bike lanes, they're met with conflict, tension, and verbal and physical violence. And so these questions I want to continue to think about are not just, you know, not just a right to the city, but a right to any kind of public space. What does that look like? Um, and what does the right to mobility, more broadly speaking, uh, entail for everyone? Okay, I think, I think that might be it. There might be one more slide. So, yeah. So I, I would leave it with the, the fact that as I'm theorizing mobility justice, I want to be thinking about centering non-hegemonic groups and research designs, um, continuing to think about the intersecting nature of oppressions and research approaches that are going to be able to acknowledge the intersecting um, nature of oppression. And again, continuing to uh, always reframe things in the historical context or the geographical context. And then I do have lots of ideas that we can talk about in terms of how do we how do we actually put this into practice? Um, so if we know these barriers are out there, what does it mean to actually um, think of different solutions? So I've got some slides on that if we have questions. Interview.